I am a naturalized U.S. citizen. I was born in the former Soviet Union. It, it, it was communism. I mean, it's communism in its purest form. People were reliant on the government to protect them. And guess what? They weren't very well protected. It was a very corrupt government. Can you name a time where any other government agency over the course of five to six years have swapped their minds? I, I can tell you a time when, when I lived in Soviet Union where they changed their minds on pretty much everything uh, month to month. It's I think it's time to hold them accountable for everything that they're doing. We have an agency that is a regulatory agency, but it's essentially taking the power away from Congress. And, and we've seen a lot of that Lately, you know, with all the proposed rulemaking and and all this stuff happening now, and and all the stuff that you guys are doing in court, by the way, it's, it's amazing. But the 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 issue is this: you're taking the power away from Congress to make laws, and you just arbitrarily creating your own laws and giving the executive branch just a huge amount of power to do whatever they want. And and I I feel like that's really the the issue at hand. Welcome to Gun Owners America State of the Second Podcast. My name is John. And I'm Kaylee. And today we are joined by Alex, who's an industry expert in marketing. Alex, thanks for joining. Hey, thank you for having me, guys. It's a pleasure. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, so you have kind of had a ton of roles in the industry from one side of the industry to the other and, and really have become an expert when it comes to the Second Amendment community and have seen a lot of trends and, and rises and falls. So <laughs> excited to have you on this Thank show. You. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say I, I'm, I'm, I'm an expert. I, I've been in the industry for about eight years. Um, I've seen a lot of really interesting things, um, industry side, regulation side, um, and everything in between, you know, between the changing administrations from uh, Obama to Trump to to now <clears throat> Biden um, and excuse me for wearing the Nike shirt I'm I'm live in California that's how I blend in with other people there oh man <clears throat> you are stuck behind enemy lines I'm my stuck friend. behind enemy lines I and and I'm looking to get away someday um, hopefully sooner than later I'm dragging you to Phoenix you are yes. You don't know that yet. I'm just going to drag don't, you to Phoenix. Don't tempt me. It's just, I'd go, <laughs> but it's like hotter than hell in Phoenix. That's 100, 100, 120 degrees is not my ideal environment. But you can right cook now. outside at the same time. You can cook on like on the top of your car outside. That's, yeah. That's, that's, that's awesome. It's saving money. Yeah, you, you have fun doing that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So <laughs> Kaylee mentioned you've been in a wide variety yes. of areas in the industry. Mm -hmm. At one point, you worked for an 80% company. Yes, I did. You've seen the ups and downs and uh, attacks on that. Yeah. I love to just pick your brain on that because you, more than <laughs> anybody, know everything about that. I mean, yeah. Um, well, as we know of 80 percenters and, and, and gun building as a whole, I mean, that's that was something that's just ingrained in the American society, right? For since the, the inception of this com this country, I mean, um, you know, from blacksmiths to, um, you know, gun builders in the, in the, in the West and, in you know, and then, um, now with, with the modernization of technology, um, 80% receivers. So, um, those were the receivers that the ATF back in the day, um, you know, after they were submitted to the ATF, said, you know, this is not a firearm. It's completely legal to to own, to build, and, and to use it at home. So, um, as we know, administrations change, and unfortunately, policy changes with it, and, and so it becomes another headache. Yeah, I mean, I think you touched on it, yeah. but this is something that is older than our republic. Absolutely. And the the downside to... The government just changing definitions, which mm -hmm. they have gotten very good at doing mm -hmm. um, as of recent. Not only are you taking away someone's right, Correct. Um, but you're also really stifling people from understanding the technology, taking ownership. Mm -hmm. you know, at GOA, we have a, a definition of a gun rights activist. Everyone's probably heard it 500,000 times, right. but it's someone who takes personal responsibility, not only in the use of their firearms, but in the defense of their right to own them. Mm -hmm. And so when you see an attack, especially one by an unelected bureaucracy, Correct. it is just staggering the, the long-term effects and repercussions of 
a radical move like that? I mean, the what what is the bigger issue? The bigger issue is this, that um, we have an agency that is a regulatory agency, but it's essentially taking the power away from Congress. And, and we've seen a lot of that lately, you know, with all the proposed rulemaking and, and all this stuff happening now and, and all the stuff that you guys are doing in court, by the way, it's, it's amazing. But the, the, the issue is this, you're taking the power away from Congress to make laws and you're just arbitrarily creating your own laws and giving the executive branch just a huge amount of power to do whatever they want. And, and I, I feel like that's really the, the issue at hand. And, and that's what you guys are fighting right now. And God bless you all. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. I can't take any credit for it. <laughs> um, our legal team yeah. is is phenomenal. And, and we're so blessed to have our legal team representing our members and supporters. Um, it's a shame yep. that we're having to file the lawsuits yep. that we're having I mean, to file. I mean, if you just look at the pistol brace ban. Yep. Alone, yep. overnight, 40 million Americans becoming felons for owning a, a, essentially what's a piece of plastic. It's so it's so ridiculous. And, and a piece of plastic that was, what, seven years before was ruled to be, just, okay, great, after it was submitted to, you know, to that regulatory agency. Well, it's... Um, it's the ATF's war on plastic, like Kaylee says. They're going after stuff that's minute. It started right. with the bump stocks, and then it right. went to eighty percent. Now it's on right. this. I mean, what? Where does it stop? And if we keep giving the little inches, we gave you know the inch was given on bump stocks. Mm -hmm. Where where is this going to stop? It, it I mean, it, it it doesn't until you have an administration in the White House that actually cares about gun rights and and cares about. The tradition of, of Americans. I mean, the, mm -hmm. gun ownership is, is a tradition. Yeah, um, it's not something that a lot of people get to do around the world and, and and protect themselves and and protect their own property and 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 hunt and and do these other things with firearms. Go on the weekend with our friends and, and target practice. Right? It's it's an American tradition that that is slowly being taken away because there are people in government that don't trust you to do it and don't want you to have that power and will do anything to take it away from you. Yeah. And that, that word tradition is right. so important. So gun owners foundation is GOA sister organization mm -hmm. and our uh, motto, our, you know, you're in marketing. Our, yeah. our slogan has always been text history and tradition. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of the, the first to sue on those grounds. Right. And thankfully when it came to the Buren decision, it was the Supreme Court that said, no, this is the standard right. by which you have to use to right. judge all Second Amendment cases. Right. Because ultimately, we have to remember that our Second Amendment is constitutionally protected, not government granted. Right. And so when we look at things like the, the pistol braces, mm -hmm. for example, you know, the foundation, Gunners Foundation, released a, a video through, through bullet points that went through the history of braced handguns. Right. And there are patents and there are there's a huge uh, history there that predates America. Right. And so the fact that just one day someone's like, you know what, we should ban these is just so <laughs> ludicrous. Well, it, I love how you, you touched on, you know, we, we talk about tradition. You touch on the tradition of building guns in, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And for a period of time, it, it died down. Yes. And I would say that you are one of the revolutionaries of, of the gun <laughs> bill. And you can laugh at that, but it, it's true. Without you and what you did, do we see the slides and the barrels and the customization and the building from the ground up yeah. that, that has started in the last eight years? eight to 10 years now. I mean, one of the main things when I was working in, in that world, um, one of the main comments I would hear all the time is that, you know what? I learned so much about building a gun just by having this product. And um, it was a weekend project for me. It was a project with my son. Um, it It's something that brought us closer together just by working on, on this, on this product. Um, and people have so much pride just taking their newly built gun, taking it to the range and um, just firing it and, make, and seeing that it's working and just, you know, just being blown away how, how great this thing is. And it's, for the most part, was their favorite firearm because 
it's theirs. It's their own manufactured mm-hmm. firearm that they didn't just, you know, take from, from a store, do the whole transfer thing, and they just fired it out of, right out of the box. No, it's it's something that they worked on for the weekend, and it's 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 their own. It has their own blood, sweat, and tears over it. So sometimes tears because they just didn't know what they were doing. But... <laughs> Um, but but yeah, I mean, it, it was just pride and ownership, and and that's one of the main things that that is is being taken away from people right yeah. now. I think that those those kind of moments, mm-hmm. and and I think one of the things about those moments that are so impactful yep. is that generational thing. Correct. You know, if we go back to the the famous Ronald Reagan mm-hmm. quote, you know, freedom is only a, a generation away from extinction. Yep. Yep. And so when you see that, people kind of get used to the tyranny that they're under, yes. right? It's it's that whole, uh, what is it, the frog in the boiling water. Yes. Um, and you don't know when to hop out. Yep. When you have someone who understands the Second Amendment, understands that it's a natural right, and then shares it with their niece, their nephew, their their son, their daughter, and there's an educational component. Right. Guess what? Those kids don't want to lose that right either. They don't. And you have a Second Amendment whether you choose to exercise it or not. Yep. You're giving something up if you if you let a political organization take that away, which Absolutely. is which is what you're having with with the federal government, unfortunately. Well. Alex, you you touched on something, and it's the right to keep and bear arms and shoot, and that's not seen around the world. It's definitely not, no. You have a story, an experience. Yeah, so um, I am a naturalized U.S. citizen. I was born in the former Soviet Union, and and I can say it's a Soviet Union because when I was born, it was the Soviet Union. So I, I left right before that iron wall Gorbachev and everything we just <laughs> did uh, um, for right before the Iron Wall came down, um, and it, it it was communism. I mean, it's communism in its purest form. It was a Soviet Union, and and um, people were reliant on the government to protect them. And guess what? They weren't very well protected. It was a very corrupt government, and um, is a government that did not did not really care much for its citizens, right? Because they can pretty much do whatever they want. They had all the power. Um, it, it's just a fundamental right that we never got to enjoy living there. Um, and, and having it here is absolutely amazing. And that's why I joined this industry because I, I fully believe in what um, fire ship, fire, <laughs> firearms ownership stands for. It's, it's being self-reliant, self-protecting. Now, seeing that, yes. Do you is there any fears that you have as being someone who lived through that? That you see that you're worried that you could preach to our our member base right. and go, "Hey, th- it's time to take action to vote and yes. get the right people in place." I mean, I live in California. California is probably the the closest thing to, and I don't. I, I mean, I don't want to bash the state because there's just we're really talking about very few metropolitan populated areas that that pretty much govern the state, right? We're talking about like San Francisco, San Diego, Los Angeles. Um, There's a a lot of gun owners, very proud gun owners in California that just aren't getting their voice heard, right? Um, For for that state, they want you to rely on government. They, 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 they feel a, a safe, like they feel a, a safety in not having guns around because they have the police, the government to protect them. But well, that's not really the case. Uh, some of the most well-regulated, um, supposedly gun-free regulated areas like Oakland is, is, is a mess and, and they can't do anything about it. And then, and people cannot protect themselves in, in that, in that environment, unfortunately. So. Yeah, one of the things that I think a lot of people yeah. are concerned about yeah. when it comes to writing an email to a legislature Correct. or sending a postcard or, or calling is this this fear of does it matter? It absolutely matters. Yeah. It it, it, it does matter. Um, the reason why they're not hearing your voice is because you're not doing it, right? Um, I'll give you a good example. Um 
I would say that the whole thing with David Chipman, right? Like we, when, when he was being announced for, for the ATF leadership, right? Um, we all as gun owners went up in arms. We, we called an SSF, we called, you know, we called the, the, the Senate and we said, we cannot have this guy be in charge of the ATF. He's absolutely going to destroy gun rights here in America. Um, I've never seen such coalition of people go up against a nomination before. Um, and it happened. He, he was not in charge. Now the guy that's in charge now is probably no better. Um, but, um, we all band together as, as gun owners and we, we made sure that this guy is not there to, to stifle gun rights yeah. for this position. And we've seen this yes. before. Yeah. I, I mean, GOA, we just finished up the, the comment period for right. the, the lead ammo ban yep. um, with hunters. Yep. 94%, I believe is the final number of comments yep. came from GOA members Yes, and, and came through, through those campaigns. We've seen it in the past when uh, the ATF wanted to ban green tip ammo Correct. and we won that battle. We've seen it when we've been just massive amounts of, of gun control was in the house and Senate. We've seen people mysteriously miss votes because they're like, wait a second, you know, I'm yeah, going to go eat real <laughs> fast. Um, yep. when they were voting all day long, just yep. because, um, so many gun owners called and were like, don't take my second amendment rights away. And they were in like a little purple situation where they're like, okay, well, uh, I, I don't want to lose power. Right. And, and I think that's kind of baked into to the secret sauce of of GOA is that voice. I just wonder how many people don't realize that their voice matters. And as someone who lived in a in a area where your voice was completely stifled, how that must feel. Uh, I, I mean, just as an example, my dad knew who he was going to vote for in the next election because his boss at, at the company he was working for told him he was going to be voting for that person and there's nothing he could do about it. Um, you were told how are you going to live with whom you're going to live. You could be leaving, living in an apartment with five different strangers the next day. Um, you know, that's the government telling you what to do. And people did not have that voice. Here, we do have the voice. We can, we can call our senators. We can call... Um, we can call our representatives and we can donate to companies like, like GOA um, just to fight those battles that we cannot fight as individuals. But once we're all kind of banding together and, and voting and calling and supporting the people that do make that fight for us, then I think we can get a lot of things done here in this country. Well, I think the big thing we just saw where our voice does matter is New Mexico. Correct. The minute she said, <laughs> you can't carry guns in this county, everybody, yeah. everybody went up in arms. It was so bad. Even the awful David Hogg out of nowhere said, uh, no, she's wrong. And <laughs> and that, it's laughable because he's so anti-gun. But everybody's voice was heard that she's going after our constitutional rights. And how did she even justify that? Can, can you explain to me? How's it a <laughs> medical emergency? I have no idea. It, it wasn't justifiable it, at all. It was you can't un unconstitutional. Yeah. Plainly unconstitutional. Yeah. And I want to say that this is the only time we've ever seen anything yeah. like this. And definitely it is to the extreme. Yep. But let's not forget that it wasn't very long ago when everyone was threatening to shut down the industry because of yep. COVID. Yep. And it wasn't very long ago that GOA was filing lawsuits in Pennsylvania because they weren't issuing can still carry permits during COVID because of a, of a health crisis. And so these are things that unfortunately we're seeing more of, and it's important that everyone goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like, no, absolutely not. And now we're, we're kind of the, the silent majority yeah. as a lot of people want to, to put it is, is getting more awake, Correct. which is so important because the echo chamber that they're creating is only an echo chamber if we stay silent. Yes. As you know, GOA filed for a, a preliminary injunction. We filed for a national injunction. We were able to get our members covered with that injunction. Right. The judge ruled on that. Yep. As somebody who works for a company or consults for a company that yep. is highly affected by this, yep. what does this look like for you guys? Could this be 
do you have to pivot? How much you got to spend to pivot? Like, what does this look like? I mean, just as a whole, not ju- not just not just the company that I that I um, consult with, but also like the whole industry. I mean, it's it's creating havoc because people just don't know what they don't know. They just think, hey, this is illegal now. The braces are banned. It's a gray area, so there's nothing I can do about it. So I'm just not going to buy anything. Um, what essentially what it's doing is and what 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 they're succeeding is doing is just making companies hurt and, and, and just hitting them in the pocketbooks. Right. Um, I, I feel like people need to be educated in what's really going on. And I know you guys won that preliminary injunction, which is great. So every time all these companies go to a trade show, or they go to a gun show. Um, they have, they have their retailers that sell their product. They absolutely have to mention to the, to the, to their consumers that, Hey, become a member of GOA. You are covered by this preliminary injunction. You can put whatever the heck you want on that end of that, you know, little shorty, and and be fine. You're you're good until one. We have this in place right now. Until something changes, go ahead and and just you know enjoy your rights to shoot this product. It's fine. Um, I, I feel like it it has to start with an education. And now I do really hope that the judge in your case like really follows the constitutional law, understands Bruin and, and makes the right decision. And, and you know, that you guys are ultimately victorious in getting that national injunction for everybody. And I feel like you will be. Yeah. I mean, our legal team is incredible. And uh, I give all of the, (laughs) all of the credit where it is, is, is rightfully due. Right. Um, One of the things that is so difficult, at least from the, the perspective of where the braces came from and understanding the braces. Mm -hmm. Cause I think a lot of people who maybe joined the new gun owners of the last few years are probably looking at everyone talking about this and they're like, why do you care? (laughs) (laughs) What is this? Do I have it? You know, like a lot of people, it was so commonplace and it's so, it is so commonplace and it is a part of our culture that it, it seems almost comical, comical. To, to try to explain to yes. someone. Um, but when we looked at why this was created, and really this is a stripping away of rights for people who might not be able to handle a full-size rifle, might have a disability. Correct. This is massively going after the veteran community. This is, again, part of a targeted attack. We've seen them go after veterans' rights time and time and time again. And so it's so crucial that we understand and see where the braces came from, why they happened, to even understand the insanity that it is that they're, they're banning this product to begin with. I mean, like, like, like we know that they approved this product, you know, back then and everything was fine. And then now it's suddenly, you know, it's, it's on their agenda to not approve this in its current configuration. I don't understand why they would do that. It's, it's just horrible, horrible what they're doing. And, and I, and I hope that, you know, that you guys prevail. Absolutely can, do. Can you name a time where any other government agency over the course of five to six years have swapped their minds on braces, bump stocks? You've got 80 percenters. You've got FRT triggers. They have approved these items and people bought them. And now you're a felon because you own it. Well, I, I can tell you a time when when I lived in Soviet Union where they changed their minds on pretty much everything uh, month to month because they can do that. But. We, we do have rights and, and we do hold, hold our government accountable because, guys, they work for us. We don't work for them. Yeah. So um, it's, I think it's time to hold them accountable for everything that they're doing. Well, it's the same thing as we, we should not only hold you know, the ATF accountable, but we should also hold the companies accountable who have given out their customer list. And, have, and we just saw that happen a few months back with Liberty Safes. You know, they shouldn't be giving up our Second Amendment rights because they can. Yep. And we've all see, we all saw how that turned out. <laughs> you know, you don't mess with people's rights, especially a right that says shall not be infringed in it. Yeah, 
I, I mean, I, I can't really comment on Liberty Saves and what they did, but I do have some ideas on what may have happened. Um, but it's still not cool what did transpire. Um, uh, I, I feel like our privacy should be solely protected. And I know there's a lot of companies out there that are fighting, you know, they're, they're for the rights of their customers and their privacy. So, I mean, kudos to those companies. Um, they're absolutely doing a great job. I know you guys work with Daniel Defense, and they're one of those companies that, that are very protective of, of you know, of, of the information. And I think they're fighting a good fight right now. So when we look at the industry, we understand that there is an attack by the ATF. We understand that there is an attack by the federal government, state governments, people wanting to limit the types of firearms that are available in the U.S. and, and those infringements. One of the things that is so difficult to even comprehend in some ways is this push to regulate banking, to track purchases, um, to essentially create a de facto registry yep. in many regards. Kind of what's your take on that from this marketing consulting that you work that you do? Gosh, that's a loaded question. Um, I would say that the, the whole point of, of this is that, you know, you, you own a right to privacy. I mean, we already don't have any privacy online, right? They're every, everything and anything you social media, they're tracking everywhere you go and what you do. Um, now that your purchases are being tracked and it doesn't even matter if it's firearms or anything else. I, mean, I think that's just one of the biggest infringements on, on our own privacy. Like nobody should have the right to know what I buy, where I bought it and who I bought it from. Um, unless I did something wrong and, and I'm in trouble with you by utilizing this product and, and probably, um, I mean, how, how do I cut that out? I don't, I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to say that too much. Like I, I feel like, um, as long as I bought something and I'm in, I'm utilizing it responsibly and I'm being a good citizen, nobody should know anything about what I own and what I have. So you talk about like they shouldn't know what you, you yeah. have, and and they yeah. use this this term "gun show loophole" and things yeah. like that. And now yeah. they're attacking the right to sell your firearm. And if you they're redefining what a dealer is. Yep. And as somebody who who's an avid collector and, and an enthusiast like you and I both are, you know, what does that mean for you? Like, you probably have bought stuff and you're like, okay, now I can sell it and make a little bit of money. Well, I can't sell anything because I live in California and they don't well, allow any of that stuff. So I, whatever I have is my own and nobody needs to know what I have because I am a responsible gun owner and I use it responsibly. So the ATF is, is has a proposed ruling out there yes. where they're redefining what an FFL is, what a business is. It, it, yep. And they're trying to go after saying that if you sell a firearm and make a profit on it, you are now doing business in gun sales and you are now an FFL. The other thing they're doing and what they love doing is creating these loopholes mm -hmm. where if you're an FFL and you are going out of business or you're selling off your, your pro, you know, what you have in stock, they're going after them saying this is their fire sale loophole because it's you know as a as a business you have to make the money that you can make before you close right and the these new loophole terms because they love to use the word loophole is going after just not only you as a common citizen to sell something that you bought because it's no different than buying a stereo system and deciding that you don't want it anymore you know why why do you think they're going after this is it's as a person and, and how do you feel about that and changing the definition as somebody who's worked for a manufacturer and who's worked, you know, right in the industry. It, because, uh, you know, it, as a responsible gun owner, if you provide, if you give or, or sell something to another responsible gun owner, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody should be able to, to really dictate, you know, like what I need to do. Like it's, it's, I, I'm not an FFL. I'm not a gun store. Like it's, I shouldn't be regulated as such. Um, I, I've, I've actually never, again, I, I live in California. We, we don't really do too much of that there. So I'm, I'm not, not fully in tune with that, but I, I do feel like this whole thing is just to know what you have, what you're doing with it and who now has it. And it's, 
you know, especially if you haven't really done anything wrong, it's nobody's business what you do and what, what your own private property. I mean, and, and this may go, yeah. again, you live in California, so it's yeah. a little bit different for you, but let's just say you, you bought, and the, the same thing is multiple gun purchases within 30 days. Okay. Okay. Or, or purchases and selling guns within yep. 30 days of purchasing them. You buy a gun. Basically what that's saying is you buy a gun, you don't like it. You ended up not liking it. You yep. go sell it back, and then you buy another one. Well, yep. now you're you're conducting arms business. So, if, if, you know, they, they do those background checks, and nothing's wrong with you. you ha- you're a responsible citizen. There's, there's no, no, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing that they can possibly get at you about it. I feel like you should do whatever you want, you want to do. I mean, it's whether you buy one gun or two guns or, or buy trade out multiple guns within the 30 days, like who cares? You're, you're, you're a free responsible citizen. You should be able to do whatever you need to do. So <laughs> I really don't know much about this. <laughs> yeah, it's right. it it like, you're like, threw me over a curveball. Like, well, like, I like throwing you know curveballs at you. <laughs> So (laughs) let's talk about something that in California, not only and and in many parts of the the anti-gun left controls, these made up terms. Yep. Red flag laws. Okay. Gun confiscation orders. Yep. This is not only an attack on the Second Amendment, but it's attack on the Fourth Amendment. Right. In a really big way. From the industry perspective, how is this conversation shaping? I know so many people have just accepted the term red flag law. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so how are you, how do you see combating this terminology battle that we're having from the truth to to the made up um, <laughs> language? Well, you're you're never. The hard part is you're never going to change like a politician, right? That like a lot of them are in their little soapbox. Their mind's already made up, right? So they're, they're going to use red flag law. Um, but in those states where um, where you see that happening in those embattled, embattled states like California, New York, you know, New Jersey, um, I think everything starts at the bottom, right? Like it's, 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 it's a grassroots effort. You have to explain family, friends, whoever else that doesn't understand what that means. You, you have to tell them what's wrong with, you know, those term, that terminology, those policies, and hopefully you change their minds. So when, when it comes time to vote, when it comes time to choose their next representative, they know what's up. They know like, hey, what they're saying is a bunch of baloney. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's what we're hoping. We're hoping that yeah. we have more educated right. voters who know that th- th- voting – on a certain way, because your people have told you to vote that way, and as right. you you said, your dad was told to vote a certain way. Yeah, we need to change their mind and go. You need to look at the issues because they may not align with you, even though you've been told your whole life this is your political party. You, they don't, they, they don't align know. with what you personally believe in. The the great thing about gun owners, we guys, we are so in tune with laws and government and what's happening in every branch of government. We are, most people are like that. Just so you guys know, most people are completely clueless about what's, what's going on, even in their own County. So you have to get vocal about it. You have to explain to your friends and family what's happening and, and, you know, hopefully you're convincing enough to change their mind, but let them think about it. I mean, that's where it all starts, right? That's where change starts from education. Yeah, no, I, and I think that's a critical piece, right? We can only do so much to convince anyone, right? especially the further away from that person that yep. you are. And so us as individuals having conversations with our friends, with our families, yep. starts the chain reaction that a Facebook ad or an, an Instagram ad or is as phenomenal as it is that we have the ability to host um, a podcast. Yep. A podcast is not really going to change someone's mind. No. If they are radically against something, it might. Okay, there's always that one that's like, <laughs> oh, you know, like this was the this was the thing that got me. But generally speaking, someone talks about it, kind of plants a seed of curiosity, yep. and then the more that you talk about them, and one of the greatest things that ever happened, and this is totally a personal antidote, 
as I was in college and, and talking to someone about the Second Amendment. And they went to research firearm ownership to prove me wrong <laughs> using my own sources. And what ended up happening is like a month later, they were like, so I think you might be right. Would you mind going to the range with me? Right. And and so you never know what's going to be the thing that, yeah. that goes, okay, well, actually, there, mur mass murder is, is still illegal. Murder is yeah. still illegal. Assault is still illegal. Yeah. It's not the firearms fault. Nope. It's not the Second Amendment. And so I encourage anyone that can have those conversations to have them. Absolutely. I, I mean, uh, and I can tell you a story from my own experience. I mean, firearms ownership. My my aunt was deathly afraid of owning guns. I mean, she's she's a, an immigrant woman from you know that that's lived here all her life. She's never even considered owning a gun until she was mugged outside like a really fancy mall like three years back. Now she shoots her Glock 19, and she absolutely absolutely loves it. Yeah. So. Um, it, it, it's personal experiences, but it's also like education, educating people that firearms are, you know, they're, they're fun to shoot, but they're also there to protect you from anything that's bad that, that can happen to you. Well, you guys both have stories and yeah. we, we all have a story right. like this. And for the audience out there, uh, share those stories, yep. you know, cause in the last three years, yep. we've seen gun ownership, jump up by 9 million yes. new gun owners. And there's a lot of people who've seen that the same experience that you had with the people at college, Kaylee, and you had with your aunt, you know, a lot of people are seeing that they can't, there's not always a police officer that are protect nope. you. There's not always, you know, you're not always going to, you think you're in a safe area, but you're not, there's a chance that something can happen. Right. And we saw that during COVID. We saw a lot of people taking the responsibility for their own personal protection into their hands. And that's what I love to hear because having an experience of taking somebody new to the range or having, you know, teaching somebody new, bringing people in, this is what we want as a 2A community. We want to bring more people in so that they understand that it's not just, you know, it's an inalienable right, but it's not just about shooting and killing and all that. Right. It's about having fun and being enjoying our Second Amendment rights. Yep. We want to thank you guys for joining us again. Again, remember to join GOA. It's $25 for the year. Go to gunowners.org for that. Leave us a five-star review on all podcasting apps and all podcasting hosting platforms. Thumbs up on YouTube. Go follow us at State of the Second, all spelled out on all major social media platforms. And have a great rest of your day.